Hello and welcome back to your Grace Campus. It's amazing to be back in the room together again. We are in a fantastic series called Miraculous. But before we hear today's message, here are a few ways you can get involved at Grace. Alpha is starting again in October. Alpha is a series of sessions where you can get to explore faith and ask questions about life in a safe environment. This time around, Alpha is happening online and at each campus. Make sure you register today. Each week, our Grace Kids team makes sure that your kids not only join the adventure of following Jesus on a Sunday, but they continue the adventure at home during the week. You can find our weekly Faith at Home content on our website. Just follow the link or email gracekids at grace for more info. In celebration of Heritage Day this past Thursday, we are selling voice rolls after the service. It's 20 Rand per voice roll and all proceeds go towards food parcels for families in need. Grab a voice roll and you won't have to worry about lunch today. Are you following us on social media? Our platforms are a place for us to share sermons, encouragement and news on what's happening at Grace. These are all the links you need to know, so go ahead, follow us and say hi this week. Welcome to Grace Online. My name's Dylan. And I'm Jess. And we're super excited to have you here. There's many of us that are going back into our normal campuses, our physical gatherings, but I want to tell you something, that we aren't going anywhere as the online campus. If you're watching now, you're probably uh, maybe not safe, you're not feeling safe to go back into one of the buildings, or you're watching because this is now your home. So welcome, welcome home. Welcome home. <laughs> we're so excited to have you guys here, and we're going to be carrying on every single week at nine o'clock or from whatever time you're watching. It's going to be live, it's going to be wherever you need it, and we have not forgotten about the kids. So if you have kids with you, press pause now, have a look through the comment section, there's a link there that you can click, and uh, your kids can enjoy the amazing content that our Grace Kids team is working through at the moment. Put them on another device and enjoy your time with us. Speaking of that, we're about to head into a time of worship where Katie is going to be leading us. So I want to encourage you, however you worship at home, whether you sing out loud, whether you dance, whether you just need to sit quietly with your eyes closed, whatever it is, I encourage you to do that and to listen to see what God may want to say to you during this. So great to have you join us today. We're just going to spend a few minutes singing and worshiping our God. So we invite you to lean in and join us this morning. My soul, remember this. He took my sin and deep.
Jesus lives in me For I was dead in sin But I woke up to see the light Sunday and this song is very close to my heart. It has been a real anthem for me over this past season and I'm going to let the word speak for itself but the first line reminded me of a very special verse, a very important verse to me as a worshipper from Zephaniah. The first line is in the morning you sing over me and in Zephaniah 3 verse 17 it says for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior He will delight in you with gladness. With His love, He will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. How awesome is that? That as we're worshiping and we're singing to God, He's taking great delight in us. And He's rejoicing over us with His own song. Anyway, I thought that was really, really cool. But why don't you let this song speak to you as we sing this morning? In the morning you sing over me And I receive your mercy Your faithfulness is clear to see It's constant every day In the morning, in the morning you sing over me receive your mercy your faithfulness is clear to see like the sunrise it's constant every day for me 
God's not worried. And why do I worry? God knows what I need. And why do I worry? And why do I worry? Why do I worry? God knows what I need. He knows. Jesus, we know you to be faithful and true. We know you to be good. We know that your hand is not so short that it cannot save. And Jesus, in this place today, we just take a moment to remind ourselves of how great, how magnificent and how beautiful you are. And we take a moment to thank you. We don't take it for granted that the creator of the universe pressed paused and created man. We don't take it for granted that you breathed your breath into our lungs and you call us brother and friend. So Lord, today we say thank you. Thank you for being more than enough. Thank you for being greater than anything we can ask or think. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna carry on in this attitude of worship and you're gonna have the opportunity now to, to bring your tithe and to bring your offerings. And I just wanna say, a few years ago, I was really skeptical about this whole money thing, about giving money back to God, because I mean, He's God, He doesn't need our money, so it was quite counterintuitive. So I said, hey, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go research a bit more, I'm gonna go ask people that I know about this whole thing, I'm gonna really dive into it. And as I did that, I got to the point where I was like, all right, I'm going to, God, I'm gonna trust you with 10%, I'm gonna give you uh, 10% of what, what I earn, and I'm gonna see what you're gonna do. And over time, what happened was, I started to see God uh, look after me with what I had already and it, what it did was it started building trust in my relationship with Him. I could start to trust Him with something that was so close to me which was money. And what happened was, is not only did it start impacting me where my money was, the trust, it started to filter into other places of my life. I started to trust God in my health, in my relationships, in my family, in all the different places. So that's, that's what giving does, it helps us build trust with God and allow Him to, to impact the whole of our life. So just in a moment, you're gonna see the details are gonna pop up on the screen, whether you do Zappa, SnapScan, or you need the bank t details. Um, I'm gonna pray, and while I'm, while I'm praying, you can get ready for that. Heavenly Father, just we thank you so much that you give us the opportunity to give. Not because you need our mon money, but because you, you want our hearts. So we just pray right now, Lord, that uh, the funds that come in, that we would be able to steward that well, that we would be able to use that to further your kingdom, and in that process that we would cultivate more trust in our relationship with you. So we thank you and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dull. We're so excited that you've joined us online. And uh, for those of you who are new to Grace Online, maybe you're even just new to the Christian faith and you have some questions about Jesus, about faith, and maybe just about life. Or perhaps you know someone and you can tell they feel like something's really missing from their lives right now. Well, we have something really cool coming up. So take a look at this. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather gonna be like? How am I gonna fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions. Like, why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. My girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I 
think for so many years, you know, I always just strive to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. Alpha is an eight-week course. Um, it's happening online. It starts on the 7th of October. So whether you're going to join us or maybe you have a friend and you agree you're going to zoom in with them and, and be in the same group, take note of Alpha. It's a game changer. It really is, Jess. I know Alpha impacted my life. And if I, if I never did Alpha, I don't think I'd be standing here today. And also the one thing that I loved about Alpha and still love about it is that it brings so much community. And another place, another thing with community obviously is with our online campus, we don't actually have a physical place that we can gather. So the where do we gather is we gather online. Yeah. So the one place that we're all gathering for the other 167 hours of the week is actually on Facebook. We have a Facebook group, uh, it's, called, it's the Grace Family Church online campus. You'll find the links in the comments and you can join that and answer the question so we can get to know a bit about you. And that's where we hang out. So I'll see you there. Yeah, we'd love to hang out with you. Join us on Facebook. That's where we, that's where we spend time together yeah. when we can't meet in person. And if you join the Facebook group, we'd love to hear what you think about Tom's message. This is week two of Miraculous. So hang out with us now and we'll see you later online. So we're in this series called Miraculous, and it's all about the miracles of Jesus. Now, if you're new, or perhaps you wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Christ, you may be skeptical of this whole idea of miracles, and, and I totally understand that. But here's the thing. No matter who you are or where you are in your journey of faith, all of us at some point in our lives need a miracle, some kind of intervention or a breakthrough. And so as we explore the different miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels, I believe each week there'll be something in it for you that directly impacts the situation or the challenges that you're facing right now. So the miracle we're looking at today is the miracle of Jesus healing a lame man. It's found in John chapter 5. It's also found in Luke chapter 5. Oh, and also in Mark chapter 2. In fact, there are multiple accounts of Jesus healing a lame man. And this is actually where the problem comes in because sometimes I think, I don't know about you, but I know I, we get confused between different scripture verses and different biblical stories. I heard a story about a young uh, bride who was kind of nervous for her wedding. Uh, she was planning her wedding. She decided to have a Bible verse which would kind of calm her down on her day, which had always brought her great comfort. It was the verse John 4 verse 18, which says this, that there is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out all fear. And she actually wanted that engraved on her wedding cake, uh, which is a beautiful idea. And so she called the caterer and she made all the arrangements. And about a week before the wedding, the caterer actually called her and said, are you sure this is the verse you want? John 4 verse 18 on your cake. And she was like, yes, absolutely. So she confirmed it. And after a few more questions, they said they'd decorate the cake as requested. And so the wedding day came and everything was beautiful until the reception. When the bride walked in to find the cake emblazoned with John 4, 18, which actually reads, for you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. <laughs> She'd confused one John 4, 18 with John 4, 18. Uh, 
so close and yet so far. So why do I tell you this story? Well, because I actually have a confession to make to you today, whenever or wherever you're watching this from. Um, I was on leave when we actually planned this miraculous series, and we have a preachers meeting that we gather all the preachers together. And I just saw on the little spreadsheet that the title of this sermon was Pick Up Your Mat. And obviously it was the miracle of, you know, John chapter 5, Jesus healing the lame man by the pool of Bethesda, where he says to him, pick up your mat. Anyway, on Tuesday this week, I'm talking to Paul, who's also pre- you know, preparing the message and preaching the message on Sunday. And, uh, and so he's saying, what do you think? And I'm saying, well, you know, I love the story about, you know, the, and, and, and the pool I found really interesting. And I could see he's looking at me like, how did you get that other story? Like, what is going on? He's like, well, and he says, what about the roof when they lower them down? I'm thinking, what roof? What are you, what are you talking about? And I realized <laughs> I'd assume we were preaching John 5, pick up your mat, when in fact, what they'd actually planned to preach was Luke chapter 5, which is a totally different story and a totally different miracle. <laughs> so I had been preparing the wrong message. But I'm trusting maybe God was in that because this is actually the message I felt to bring you today from John chapter 5. And the interesting thing is that both those stories are about a man who gets healed. And in both those stories, the man has a mat. Um, And those mats represent the same thing in both stories. The mats represent their pain, their past, their affliction, their excuses, their betrayals, their longing for God to do something that they simply couldn't do on their own. And here's what I realized as I read both the stories. All of us have a mat. That thing that we've struggled with for years, that that sin, that addiction, that depression perhaps, that hurt that just won't go away, that illness perhaps we're facing, the loss of a loved one, your anger problem. All of us have a mat, something that we long to get up off of and walk away from, but just can't seem to. So that's actually the title of my message today. You're going to love this. It's so, so cheesy, but I couldn't help myself. My sermon title for today is, What's the Matter? What's the matter? See what I did there? Truly sorry. But but, but, but that's that's the, what's the matter? So let's get into the story. John chapter 5. It says this, verse 2. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Now, I just have to stop there because I need to paint the picture for you. This pool was not the kind of pool you go to to get a tan. You know, this is not the the, the swimming pool at the hotel you lie around or swim laps at. This was not a five-star resort. This pool, it says, was near the sheep gate. And when a pool is next to a sheep gate, (laughs) you got to know. I mean, can you imagine the Airbnb ratings on this place? I mean, this was a pool where crippled people who people who didn't fit in, whom society had pushed out, gathered together. Verse 3 says, Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. They didn't have anywhere else to go in that society. But I love this. I love that Jesus, who could have gone anywhere, went to the place that no one else wanted to go. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Again, you kind of have to stop because isn't that like quite an insensitive question? I mean, look at me, Jesus. I've I've been sick for 38 years. Of course I want to get well. Why did he ask that question? I think it's because Jesus knew. Sometimes I think we get so comfortable in our condition that it becomes part of our persona. I am a victim. I am a divorcee. I am a failure. It defines us. This this is just who I am. And actually, we don't want to get well. We may say we do, but deep down, we'd rather stay with what we know, even if what we know is terrible, than step out into the unknown of God's promises. This man responds, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Man, there's so much that we can learn from the words of Jesus. 
But I think as I look at this story, we can learn even more from the works of Jesus, from what he actually went around doing in his life. I mean, this story, Jesus healed the man that others probably wouldn't have even noticed, that we today might have just walked right past. And I think, I think we can kind of be hard on this man. Uh, I've heard messages on this story over the years, great sermons, some of which I'm borrowing from today. But sometimes when we preach this text or hear this text, I think we can kind of be hard on this lame man because, I mean, this guy, we, we don't even actually know his name. The Bible doesn't give us his name. It just tells us about his condition. And I think that's interesting because that still happens today, right? Where life or other people will label you by what you've been through instead of by who you really are. But anyway, there's no doubt this man does make some poor choices. And in many ways, he is his own worst enemy. One of those bad decisions is who he hangs around with. I mean, I think you know this. When you sit around or hang around sick people, they may make you feel better about your situation, but they can't really do anything to help you get better and change your situation. I still believe that's true. And so, so often I think we surround ourselves with people who might support our situation, but not necessarily surrounding ourselves with people who can speak to our situation and help us rise above it. And that's true, but I'm not really sure this guy had any other option. Maybe in, in, our, in a many in our country or in this current global crisis find themselves in this predicament as well, where it feels like you don't really have control over your situation. And as much as this man might have been playing the victim or making excuses, there were in fact some very real systemic realities that he couldn't overcome because of the system and because of his condition. And this is actually usually what happens in desperate situations is that systems develop. A system that could help temporarily, but that often keeps people in struggle. And that's incredibly true in our country, isn't it? Not just our country, but countries around the world. And that's what's happening here. There's a system. And this guy simply can't beat or rise above the system. Here's the system. The system was that whenever the water started to bubble or get stirred, whoever got in the water first would get healed or, or get relief maybe. But he couldn't get there in time. Even the blind man could stumble and get there before him. But because he was crippled, he couldn't walk. He could see it, but he couldn't get to it. I mean, that's got to be the worst feeling, right? Where you can see the future that God has created for you, but you can't get to it. Where you can see the possibility of what your marriage could be, but you can't seem to figure it out. When you can see in your kids the, the potential of who they could become, who they've been created to be, but you can't seem to get through to them. It's the worst feeling in the world. So when Jesus says to him, do you want to get well? The man responds to opportunity with reality. We, we might think it's an excuse, but from his perspective, it was just the facts. I have no one to help me. The system has failed me. I need help. And we can maybe as followers of Christ, Christians, we can get self-righteous about this guy and say, hey, you know, if he really wanted to get well, he'd roll up his sleeves and he'd get to work. You know, he'd, he'd roll himself into the pool. And again, that's not untrue because sometimes we do. We have to take initiative. We have to make our way towards God any way we can. If that means we have to crawl, we crawl. If it means we have to inch, we inch. If it means we have to watch online or wear masks or social distance. or And I still believe in initiative because learned helplessness is, is one of the most devastating dynamics that affects us all. When we convince ourselves that we can't. But this story, ultimately, it's not about the man's lack of initiative. It's about God's grace. Sometimes people think that our excuses... You may think your excuses keep God from doing what he wants to do in your life. But that certainly doesn't happen here. Because when the man made his admission, of, his admission of his situation, the next thing Jesus did was change it. The man says, I have no one to help me. This isn't working. I need you, God. And once the man made that admission, Jesus heals him. And he says, get up, pick up your mat. And that for me is actually the crux of this whole story. This is what I was trying to explain to Paul and he was looking at me, he's funny, now I know why. But this whole story is actually a contrast between grace and works, between the grace of God and our own efforts to attain some kind of uh, uh, approval from God. And, and this is so important because the miracle actually had nothing to do with the man's effort. The man wasn't cured because he got up. He got up because he was cured. That's what grace is. 
1 John 4 verse 10, not that we loved God, but that he loved us first. We don't change so God will love us. We change because God already loves us, whether we change or not. That's why we like to say here at Grace, come as you are. We don't say sort yourself out, then come, you know, come to church. That, that's like saying, hey, I won't go to the gym until I'm fit. No, no, that's why you, that's why you go to the gym. I said there was a system at the pool of Bethesda and the system was whoever got in the pool first, you know, got healed or got relieved. But, but the reality, I mean, that, that was a religious system. I mean, that, 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 that's the law. Whoever gets there first wins. Whoever performs the best wins, plays his cards right, goes to church, pays his tithe, joins a small group, says sorry. Whoever does the right thing and is a good boy or a good girl gets healed. That's how so often we view God. But God shows up. Jesus shows up and says, guys, you know what? This system isn't working. The people who need the help the most can't get to it. And he totally turns the system upside down. He says, pick up your mat and walk. No water required, no system required, no performance required. Simply an admission of need. An admission. You know what? I can't do this on my own. And the great thing about this, you don't even have to understand it. I mean, this guy's making excuses. He doesn't even know who Jesus is at this point in the story. And still God heals him. It's the genius of Jesus that he can work in your life before you even know it's him. He can work in your life even when you don't know what he's doing. That's certainly been true for me as I look back on my life. And that's what grace does. In all my years of preaching and pastoring, I'm absolutely convinced. Please hear this. There's no stronger force in the universe than the grace of God, the love of God. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of thousands of others. When we fully grasp and understand the length, the breadth, and the width of God's unconditional and unwavering love for us, it changes everything from the inside out. I'm telling you, grace will get you up. Grace will make you strong. Grace will make you stand. Grace will walk past everything you've listed as an excuse and empower change in your life. Can I say that again? Grace will get you up. It'll get you up when works can't. It, grace will, will lift you up when your efforts fail. Grace will lift you up when your words fall short. It'll lift you up when depression holds you down. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And this is hard for us to accept because you might say, hey, Tom, what about God helps those who help themselves? Well, firstly, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> and secondly, it's certainly not in this story. In this story, it looks like Jesus helped someone who couldn't help himself. This is the essence of grace. And please don't hear me. I'm not saying don't, you know, don't work hard. I'm not saying don't do all the things you know you need to do to put things right, to get healthier, to protect your mind, to stay connected to God. Come to church, read your Bible, say you're sorry, forgive, give. All these things are part and parcel of what it means to follow Jesus. We can't escape that. But they're not the engine. They're a byproduct. They're not the driving force. The driving force is the grace of God in our lives, poured out for us freely on the cross. Otherwise, what was the point of Jesus' sacrifice in the first place? Let me come back to the story. The man gets healed. He picks up his mat. He starts walking. But the story doesn't end there. So often we stop on verse 9a, which says, you know, he, he picked up his mat and he walked. But we must read on because verse 9b says, but this miracle happened on the Sabbath. And this is so important because the Sabbath was really the kind of system that governed so much of the people of Israel, the Pharisees' relationship with God. And the Sabbath was always meant to be a gift from God to the people, a gift of rest. But by the time Jesus arrived on the scene, the people had twisted it and turned what God had intended for a gift. They turned it into a grind. And that's what religion will always do. It'll turn a gift into a grind. Start to get you to work for things that have already been freely given. So that's what happened with the religious leaders. They'd, they'd come up, they'd taken this, this, this uh, principle of you know, the Sabbath, and they'd come up with all these sub-clauses and subtext and put more rules to protect the Sabbath. They said, you can only do a certain amount of work, but not this much. 
And they actually calculated, this is crazy, they actually calculated how much weight you were allowed to lift. Not like weightlifting, like if you could pick up a certain tool to farm or not. And, and if you did pick up uh, one tool was too heavy, another one, and if you did, you're only allowed to pick that thing up more, you know, a certain number of times because that was total weightage for the day. I mean, it was crazy. It's a crazy system. And that's what religion does. It creates crazy systems that get so far away from God's intention in the first place. And man, I see this in church all the time. I think it's the root cause of so much hurt in the church. Get bogged down. And so it says this, but this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected and they said to the man who was cured, oh my word, amazing, you're walking, praise God. No, they didn't say that. This is what they said. It's crazy. You can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. I mean, it's like, guys, that's what you noticed. The dude has never walked before, has now just walked past you, and all you can see is his mat. It, it's crazy. It's not surprising, though, because I'm always amazed how religious people will totally miss how far you've come and only see what you're doing wrong. All they can see is what you're carrying and they can't see necessarily what you've come through. Because here's the truth, if they really knew where you'd come from, if they really knew where I'd come from, if they really knew, they'd, they'd know this is a miracle that I'm even speaking to you today, let alone leading a church. They'd, they'd stop looking at my mat and start praising God that I'm even walking around. I love verse 11, it says this, but he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. I mean, this guy is like a walking excuse. He actually blames Jesus. He's like, it's not my fault. It's the guy who told me to pick up my mat. He didn't even know Jesus' name. <laughs> and, and, then, and then I love this part. This is kind of the coolest part of the story. Think about this. Why did Jesus tell the man to take the mat when he wasn't going to need the mat anymore? I'm not sure if you ever thought about that. Steve Furtick helped me to see this for the first time. Why didn't he just say, get up, you know, pick up your mat and, and, and leave it? But you see, I, I may be wrong on this, but I think Jesus knew that the mat weighed more than the man was allowed to pick up on a Sabbath. And I think Jesus knew that the mat represented to many people who had seen him lying there for 38 years. It represented where the man had come from, the things he'd been through. And I think maybe Jesus wanted him to carry that mat with him so that the people he passed by could identify with the struggle that Jesus had set him free from. I know for me, in my own life, when I've been through something hard, there's a part of me that just wants to kind of forget about it and, and, and just leave it behind. But this man carrying his mat, it's like a, a neon sign pointing to heaven so that people could see what God had done in his life. When I realized that for the first time, man, it moved me. Because I never want to get too far away from remembering who I was without the grace of God in my life. So that people can look at my life and say, but, but for the grace of God goes Tom. And this is true. I mean, people who know me from my, my university days, you tell them now I'm a pastor, I promise you they'd look at you crazy. Like, really? Wow, God can do miracles. <laughs> So I think this man's mat became this man's testimony. Romans 8 verse 28. You may know this verse, a well-known verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And this is such a critical verse, such a powerful promise that God can use all things for our good. All mats, all failures, all mistakes, all seasons, all sicknesses, all setbacks, all situations. And somehow, somehow... He can use those things to actually bring about good. Not just our good, but good for others as well. That's why people who've lost children are the best people to help others who are grieving the loss of their children. It's why you can help that young businesswoman or businessman not make the same mistakes you did in business because you've already made them. And yes, it was painful, and yes, it hurt, and yes, you probably still walk with a bit of a limp, but God has used and is using your mat, your pain, your history, not just for your good, but for the good. And that's the thing about the story, that Jesus wasn't just healing a man, it was much bigger than that. He was challenging and changing a system, a system that had failed the man in the first place. And let me tell you this, God is still doing that today. 
He's still working to break down the systems that want to keep us apart, keep us divided, keep us, you know, hating one another and, and, and broken, keep us fighting with each other on Facebook. <laughs> keep people blind and lame and poor and hanging around the pool. Jesus is challenging those systems. We might think God wants to change our situation, and that's true. But what if he wants to fix the system as well? And what if, what if he can use you, your situation, your experience, your mat to help fix the, the system? And that's what happened in the story. Because when those same religious leaders found out it was Jesus who'd healed the man, they wanted to kill him. And Jesus says, good, I came to die. I love his response. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed them. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. Again, missing the point. But Jesus' reply, I love his reply, my father is always working and so am I. And so the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. My father is always working and so am I. I'm here to declare today that God is at work in your life and in this world. It may not feel that way right now for you, or if you look around the world, it may not feel like you've, it may feel like you've been lying by that pool for a long time. And I know you may be hurting as you watch this, and I'm, but I'm absolutely convinced that God wants to say to you today, pick up your mat and walk. So as we wrap up today's message, I, I wanna leave you with just three kind of um, next steps that I've already re- kind of talked to you, but just sort of summing it up. Um, that I think can help you to find healing and hope and not just to stop there, but to use that experience, your mat, your pain, to give healing and hope to others. So just three things. Tell God what's the mat. Tell God what's the matter. Just tell him what's on your heart. Pour out your soul to God. He already knows. It's okay to not be okay. God is not threatened by your anger or your frustrations or your tears or your pain or your doubts. He wants to come close to you. And he asks you, and he asks me, do you want to get well? Second thing, pick up your mat and walk. This is straight from the story. And of course, this will mean different things to different people. But I do believe that for you watching this right now, God is asking you to trust him, to trust his forgiveness, his favor, his provision, and to get up. To no longer stay bound to old stories you've told yourself or past hurts, but rather to leave that pool behind you and get going. Perhaps for some of you, it's just the courage to tell people about Jesus, to tell people what God has done in your life. Maybe to invite them to church or invite them to an Alpha course or something like it. Perhaps it's to attend the Alpha course yourself, to explore faith a little deeper. Maybe it's joining us a group, a small group or a Bible study or starting to give financially or or maybe it's going back to the gym or pitching that idea at work. I, I don't know, but God does. So pick up your mat and walk. And then the last point, Stop sinning. (laughs) Oh, I don't like that one, Tom. But let me read you the words of Jesus, not my words, in this story to the lame man. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and told the man, now you are well. So stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Sounds like a warning, but it's really not. Something even worse, you might think, even worse than being lame and unable to walk for 38 years. What's interesting is that according to Jesus, Our physical well-being is not nearly as critical as our spiritual well-being. In fact, according to Jesus, it's possible to have everything right on the outside, but be completely spiritually bankrupt, dead on the inside. And I'll be honest, I didn't want to put that as my third point. It sounds so judgy, like, stop sinning, you sinning heathen sinners, whatever. But, But sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes you and I, we just need to be told pretty bluntly, stop it. (laughs) Just stop it. You know it's not good for you. You know it's hurting your relationship. You know it's distancing you from God. So stop it. Stop going to the websites. Stop shouting like that. Stop being so hard on yourself. Stop being so hard on your kids. Stop thinking those thoughts. It's not leading you to a good place. Stop it. And let me just say this as we wrap it up. The the, the engine for this, it's not guilt or condemnation. That'll never get you out of cycles of sin. Trust me, I've tried. The only thing that can actually do that, help us free ourselves from unhelpful patterns in our lives, like I said, it's grace. Receiving and believing in the grace of God poured out for you every single day. All of us have a mat or mats in our lives. Those things we're longing to leave behind 
or that represent our past or our pain or our problems. Mats come in all different shapes and sizes. But again, I'm absolutely persuaded that God can use all things for our good. God can reveal himself through the very things that maybe you've been asking him to remove. God works all things for our good. All things, all mats, all seasons, God is at work. And he says to you today, I'm going to take the good things, I'm going to take the bad things in your life, and I'm going to use them all. Everything you're going through will eventually turn into everything you made it through by my grace. And while you don't know what your future holds, neither do I, I know God says, who holds your future. So pick up your mat, roll it up, get up, and march into this world saying, look what God has done in my life. He's changing me. He's changing the system. The law was powerless to do it, but grace can do it. Amen. And thanks for watching. I don't know what God whispered to your heart in our time together, but I do know that we have an opportunity to trust Him, to obey Him, and to do what He says. So maybe this is the moment where you want to give. Those details are up on the screen. And maybe that is your next step in doing what Jesus is prompting you to do. Another next step, Jess, or another next step that you could take is that you could subscribe to our channel. You can share it. You can like it. It's one of the best ways to get this message out there because it might impact someone's life the same way that it impacted yours. And while you're at that, why not join our Facebook community group so that we can connect in the week. But that's all from us today. We hope that you have a good week and we'll see you next week. Cheers, guys.